second, fourth, and fifth. Skip the third verse, please. Revelation 11, 15, and 19 is our text this week. So if you're able, please stand with me and honor the reading of the Word of God. Verse 15 says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. 24 elders who sat on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. 
And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened. And the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. Would you pray with me, please? Father, again, we come to this passage just trembling at uh, your, your magnificence and the fact that you indeed will reign forever and ever. And so we just we pray, Father, as we, as we open your word, we pray that you will provide our instruction through the power of your spirit and that you will just illuminate this passage and that you will enable us through the power of your spirit to become more like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So we come to another part of the book of Revelation that makes it distinctive from the other narratives. Here we'll read where the seventh trumpet sounds, and yet the results of the trumpet we don't see until chapter 15. We'll, you'll see in the next few weeks, chapters 12 to 14, and by the way, we're going to have an Easter service next week, so we'll, we'll depart from our Revelation study for a week. And, and then when we return, um, when we resume chapters 12 to 14, it'll take us back through the tribulation and then back to the seventh trumpet, except we'll t it takes an alternate route. And instead of viewing the tribu tribulation from God's perspective, it will be revealed to us through Satan's perspective. And today we complete a section starting in chapter 4 that focused on Jesus reclaiming what was rightfully and originally his and he does so by means of the seals of the trumpets. Chapters 12 to 14 will focus on the Antichrist, whose career follows the same timelines as those judgments. And I use the word career rather loosely there. This bit of respite which we've seen in the past couple of weeks that has resembled an interlude is now coming to an end. Although here we, go, we have this one, and then we'll, it'll sort of resemble uh, another interlude in the next couple of chapters. But these respites provide comfort and encouragement for believers who have, have survived the horrific judgments that we have seen thus far. In the last few verses of chapter 11 here, we'll see a transfer, transferred realm, a taken reign, a time of rage and reward, and the temple released. Let's look in verse 15 here. We'll see the transferred realm. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Now, a, a, a quick glance back will remind us that we have studied the first six trumpet judgments. After the fifth trumpet, we were warned about three more woes. And in an interlude between trumpet blasts, the sixth trumpet sounded, as we saw last week. And now we have the third woe, which is also known as the seventh trumpet. And yet, in the bigger picture, the seventh trumpet launches the final events that lead to the Lord's second coming. And along with that will come the establishment of his kingdom on earth, which will last for a thousand years where we'll see the final anger of the Lord's judgments as well as the final reaping of souls on earth. The Lamb of God will defeat the kings of the earth and triumph in the ultimate battle at Armageddon. We must also note a difference between the seventh trumpet judgment and the last trumpet of 1 Corinthians 15, which I'll go over with you next week as we take a break from Revelation to focus on the resurrection of this victorious and returning Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The seventh trumpet judgment will cover an extended period of time rather than occurring at the twinkling of an eye, which describes the rapture of the church. The seventh trumpet calls for extended periods of judgment on the ungodly people of the world. And it also serves as the coronation of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Trumpets were often sounded in the Old Testament during the crowning of a king. And even though we were told to expect another woe, there's another delay as everything is assessed. However, heaven does not give the appearance of delay. Hope is in the air. Exhilaration is the tone. This loud voice has proclaimed another line from Handel's Messiah. The authority of the world has been transferred from Satan to Jesus, and it will remain that way for all eternity. It certainly hasn't happened yet, but it's about to unfold that Satan will be forever demoted, and Jesus will reign victorious. Now, it's a bit heady, but as, as we've been discussing this in the pastor's class, what's important for us to understand here, that in the timeline of redemption, wherein belief in God saved people from their sins, all activity points toward the thousand-year reign of Jesus with believers alongside as the ultimate prize. And we also can't sneak past John's use of a singular word here to describe kingdom, when there are clearly multiple kingdoms in the world, but all these governments will be centralized as one kingdom with one singular king, Satan. In chapter 12 alone, we'll see him referred to as the serpent of old, the accuser, and the dragon. In the Gospels, Jesus called him Beelzebul, which is translated the Lord of the Flies, the devil, the evil one, the ruler of this world, and Satan. Paul calls him Belial, which translates worthless, <laughs> the god of this world, the prince of the power of the air, and the tempter. Peter refers to him as a roaring lion seeking to devour believers. One thing we can't ever lose sight of is the fact that Satan hates us with a greater hate than you and I are capable of manufacturing. So as we talked about in the passage class, there's no need to flirt with temptation that would lead to sin. Satan hates you that much. Don't even mess with it. Now it's true that Romans 13 tells us that human governments are God-ordained for the benefit of mankind, but these same governments fail to submit to God or acknowledge His sovereignty, making them, in essence, part of Satan's kingdom. Pretty easy to figure out, right? If you're not bowing to Almighty God, the one true God of the Bible, then you're bowing to someone else, even if you think you're not. The phrase, the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, tells us two key things. First off, in the New Testament, the word Lord usually always refers to Jesus, but in Revelation, it's often used to refer to God the Father. That notion alone supports the biblical theory that they were separate, yet equal in nature. Secondly, it describes the kingdom in a most general sense as it looks forward to God's rule over the creation and the new creation. In this phrase, there is no distinction between the millennial kingdom and the eternal one. I mean, when you're looking at eternity, what's a thousand years? Seems like a lot to us now. In the big picture, it's nothing. What we need to see here, and this comes across in English to us, is that these future events were so completely certain that the loud voices in heaven speak of it as if it had already happened. I don't, I don't want to bore you with the weirdness of the Greek tenses that are involved in all this, but it's like this is future, yet they're looking at this like, What's this? this has already happened. They're that certain of it. Now let's look back quickly at a couple of Old Testament prophets who also knew this would eventually happen. Daniel 2, 44. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. And let's also look at Zechariah 14, 9. 
and the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be the only one, and his name the only one. This brief song of triumph clues us in on themes we'll see in more details in the coming chapters. The end times is well underway. The not yet aspect of the kingdom of God has also come. Everything that has been predicted is coming to pass and is in the process of becoming reality. Let's look at verses 16 to 17 and we'll see a taken reign. 16 says, And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give, thank, give you thanks, O Lord God the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Now this is the fourth time that we have seen the 24 elders fall prone in front of God the Father in order to worship Him. <laughs> May tell you a little bit more about how we should respond a little more often. These elders represent the glorified, raptured church, and they had been anticipating the day in which Jesus reclaimed the earth from the prince of the air. You can hear the tremendous gratitude in their hearts during the praise and reflects the pure thrill of realizing that their prayers had indeed finally been answered. In this short shout of praise, we see three of the attributes of God on clear and full display. First is that the term Almighty refers to God's omnipotence. There's nothing short of logical inconsistency that he could not do. Now let me explain that to you. He cannot make a circle square. He cannot contradict himself. We talked about that in the pastor's class as well. He cannot sin. It's, it's just not possible. Holy God cannot be unholy. And even the enactment of his wrath is fair and righteous. And secondly, the phrase, who are and who were, reflects God's eternity. God had no beginning. He will have no end. He is completely above time and space, although we aren't. And then third, when, the, when we read that he has taken his great power and begun to reign, it signifies the permanence of, of God's sovereignty. God is in control. He rules. He reigns. You might have some existential people tell you that they do, but the truth is God does. By the way, this little passage is why it's impossible that this glorious reign of Jesus can be connected to an event in the past. Uh, we went over this probably at the beginning. Of, there, there are people who believe that everything in Revelation was completed by the year A.D. 70 in the destruction of the temple, of, in the temple and Jerusalem. But there's nothing about Revelation that is prophetic. Frankly, I find that silly. Now, I've got friends who believe it. But I'm just telling you, this, it's one of those things where when you talk about prophetic things, you just have to, hey, how about those cowboys? You know, you just have to <laughs> take a little bit of detour there. This is a lot like the song that they sang twice in chapter 4. But we need to notice that it's slightly different. It went from the one who was, is, and is to come to who was and who is. That's it. Now the, the reason for this is that at this point, the is to come simply is. And if any of you think that I've, I've just sounded like Bill Clinton, you're right. It, <laughs> it depends on your def, what your definition of is is. History has been fulfilled. He had used his great power and unleashed it against the powers of evil and had begun to reign. Let's look at verse 18. We'll see a time of rage and reward. 
18 says, And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came. And the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. The seventh trumpet vision here realize, reveals that the nations were defiant and angry at the thought of Jesus ruling over the entire earth. The word here for enraged carries with it a connotation of a deep-seated, continuing hostility. Now, this was not simply a, moment, a momentary fit of anger, however justified that it might have been. This wasn't something that would just kind of flash up and be forgotten. Occasionally in life, <laughs> humans get bitter toward God, generally after some life-changing disappointment comes around, without realizing that God should never be the, the object of our bitterness. Our humanity may consider Him to be a convenient scapegoat for our disappointment, but we need to realize that it pleased Him to punish His Son. And we should remind ourselves daily, but at least this Friday, in order that those who trust in Him would receive eternal life. It pleased Him that Jesus would die so that I could have my sins forgiven. If you read through this book ever before, you're aware of the fact that they do eventually gather armies to fight against God. Now, let those words just kind of play pinball in your brain for just a little bit. You realize the futility of anger against God. It either shows that we consider Him to be much smaller than He is, or we consider ourselves much larger than we really are. The nations will have no desire to repent of their sin and to turn to faith in Christ, but their anger will create an insatiable thirst for revenge against God. Now let's turn back again to the Old Testament. We'll see how this reminds us of Psalm 2, verses 1 through 5. It says, Why are the nations in an uproar? and the people's devising a vain thing. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then He will speak to them in His anger and terrify them in His fury. The outcome of any battle against God has already been decided. The fear from the nations that we saw in chapter 6 has been replaced with rage. And we will see this battle called Armageddon and the judgment that comes with it in chapter 20. No one will escape judgment, whether dead or alive. The divine judgments people will experience during the tribulation should cause them to turn from their sins and to submit to God. Although the first part of Romans chapter 2 details how even after experiencing such frightening judgment and numerous warnings against spending eternity in hell, most people alive in that day will refuse to repent. The lost and the skeptical world will reach that point and will see why the events of the seventh trumpet actually on. Oh, their rage will be unquenchable. There will be no invitation at Armageddon. When we share the good news of the gospel with other people, we often hear excuses as to why they feel they cannot repent. Then there are those who try to reason that a loving God would not send anyone to hell. In the first scene, a completely immature view of heaven is noticeable. Because heaven will make the earth look like junk. In the second scenario, God doesn't send anyone to hell except those who ignore or reject Him as Savior and Lord. 
Thinking that God wouldn't pour out wrath is a false hope of the most dangerous kind, the eternal kind. As Isaiah and Ezekiel prophesied that one day God would judge unbelievers, and we're seeing the details here in the vision that, that God gave the Apostle John. When the seventh trumpet sounds, the events that all saints and prophets since the most ancient of times will be quite close to becoming reality, God will indeed pour out his wrath on his enemies. Time here, this word time, translates a Greek word that, that refers to an era or a season of time rather than the ticking of the second hand on the clock. The establishing of the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ is a fitting time for the judgment of the dead. This is not, as some believe, the great white throne judgment, since that involves unbelievers. The reference to judgment here is best seen as a general reference to all future judgments rather than a specific one. The Song of the Elders makes no attempt to distinguish phases of judgment as we'll see in the final chapters of the book. This judgment will be the time when God rewards his servants, the prophets, and saints, and everyone else who calls him Lord. Believers are encouraged to work with a view of receiving these future rewards. Believers are promised that they will inherit the millennial kingdom as well as the eternal one. Believers will also receive crowns, including... The crown of righteousness mentioned in Paul's second letter to Timothy. The crown of life as listed in James. And the crown of glory described by Peter. The phrase, your bondservants, the prophets, refers to all who have preached God's truth throughout redemptive history. From Moses to the two witnesses that we saw last week. Preachers are often described as servants. You want to slaves in Scripture. And they will receive a prophet's reward, as mentioned in Matthew 10, 41. And we see another group listed here in all the saints, and further described as those who fear your name. Saints is a simple and frequently used term to describe all true believers, and not just those who have had that title attached to them, by some church somewhere. From Billy Graham to the newest believer in this room or for someone listening over the internet, every saint will receive rewards. Now, the phrase, those who destroy the earth, has nothing to do with environmental causes, but to those whose sin scars the earth and creates enmity between it and God. All unbelievers, especially in chapter 18, where we'll see this false economic and religious system called Babylon, the Antichrist, his followers, and Satan himself are all in that group. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, Paul wrote about the mystery of lawlessness, already at work in the church age and even more obvious in America today. But during the tribulation, it will accomplish its goal of shredding the fabric of, every, of society in every way possible. People today who call for the destruction of the nuclear family in America today fit this category very well. So again, this really isn't a woe as much as it is a shout of victory. Triumph is pronounced and it is irreversible. The 24 elders fall at his feet in worship. This is not a football game. It is the single most important question anyone who ever lived must answer. How did you handle Jesus of Nazareth, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? Did you surrender to him as Savior and Lord? Or did you ignore him or have a burning rage to the level of rejecting him? If you're hearing this, now, is the acceptable time for salvation. When the seventh trumpet sounds, there will be no more pleading for you to come to him. The time to decide is now. 
Have you chosen joy with Christ or have you chosen woe without Him? Finally, let's look at verse 19 and we'll see the temple released. 19 says, and the, and the temple of God which is in heaven was opened. The ark of His covenant appeared in His temple. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. The believers are promised eternal fellowship with God that will no longer be interrupted by sin. We saw in chapters 4 and 5 that the temple in heaven is where He, the, the presence of God, resides. As it is opened, the Ark of the Covenant is now visible. It is not, as Indiana Jones would have you believe, in a warehouse in Washington, D.C. <laughs> you will recall that the Ark represented God's covenant with His people. In the process of exercising His faith on non-believers, God opens the Holy of Holies. Now what's significant about this is that this was unimaginable in the Old Testament because only high priests had access to the Holy of Holies. Here, believers are drawn into His presence. The ark represents God's communion with redeemed people because it was there that blood sacrifices were made to atone for human sins. God also spoke to Moses from above the ark. And it's also called the Ark of Testimony in Exodus, the Ark of God in 1 Samuel, and the Ark of God's strength in the Psalms. Inside it was a golden jar that contained the manna and Aaron's rod that bubbled, I'm sorry, that budded, and the tables of the covenant. A quick glance at Hebrews 9, 3 through 7 will explain this better. The contents that I just mentioned and the various names symbolize that God would supply His people, that He would be sovereign over His people, that He would make laws for His people, and that He would save His people. Accompanying the ark several, were several more weather events, both loud and violent. We've already seen these. They usually represent the majesty and glory of God's throne as well as God's judgment. Scripture thereby portrays heaven and connects it with the source of vengeance on skeptics while simultaneously seeing the covenant blessings on those who call on Him for forgiveness. The message of the seventh trumpet sounding is the sovereignty of Jesus. One day, he will reclaim the reins of the earth from Satan and his political leaders. When he returns, he will bring covenant blessing forever for those who love him and eternal judgment for those who do not. In Scripture, God rewards his people according to what we deserve. We don't deserve access into heaven. That was paid for by Christ on the cross. In the Old Testament, we see how obedience brings reward, but we must know that obedience and immediate reward are not always connected. And the reward is how God sees it, which is different from our perspective. Think about it. If it were all mathematical, then all good people would be rich and all bad people would be broke. But in today's world, the richest people around are almost all evil because they made their wealth in unscrupulous ways and now don't know what to do with it. But back to the math for a second. What would happen is we would be doing good deeds for the wrong reasons. Even though it is true that God will reward us for our good deeds, we must also remember that the greatest reward of all is spending eternity in His glory. Don't put it off another day. Because you're not guaranteed another day. Would you pray with me, please? Father, again, we just pray through the power of Your Spirit that, that You will draw people to You in a saving way. We, help, we, we pray, Father, You will help us come to the end of, of ourselves, the end of our ability to save ourselves. 
submit humbly to you as sinners in need of grace. And we just pray, Father, and, and look forward to that time when every tear is wiped away. There is no more sin, no more regret. And we look forward to spending eternity with you. We ask, Father, that you do your work even now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mark and Taylor are here. They're going to lead us in a couple of verses of a hymn of invitation. If the Lord is speaking to you this morning, I'll be down front. If you'd like to share, if there's anything that, that at all that you want to do business with the Lord about, if you want to unite with the church, if there's, uh, you need to come to trust Christ for the first time for salvation, you do that even now. If you're joining us over the internet, just email me any questions or any comments at pastor at gracingcolleague.net. And let us know if there's any business you need to do with the Lord. While they play and as they sing, you come. They 